I'm going to talk about a phrase that's used a lot of time that has a particular meaning in the scriptures that may be sometimes overlooked, and that is what it means to be children of God. We think about what it is to be a child of God. And while it might be true that in some cases people would use the term, and I must say, when, when I say this, when they'll use this term in a way of just saying we're all children of God, I appreciate that somebody is acknowledging that God is the creator of mankind. I appreciate that. But I also recognize that when we think about being a child of God and the way that it's used in the Bible, it's describing those particularly, it's describing a particular group of people. And it does not include all people. Now that might seem a shocking statement to make. <laughs> to say that not all people are children of God. But I think when we see the way that it's used in the Bible, we recognize that it, it means something a little bit different. So these various concepts that people may have about what it means to be God's children, is there's certainly some ways that we might accommodatively use those, that term in that way. But I want to pay attention to the way that it's used in the Bible. There's a phrase that we find in John, the first chapter, in verse 12, when he talks, it mentions that there are those that have the right to become sons of God, realizing, of course, that when we use the word sons, it's simply describing the children of God. That's one of the disadvantages to English versus some other languages, is that the, the word sons is simply the mas it's a masculine form that is sometimes used for the generic. That's true in Spanish, it's true in Italian, it's true in Latin, it's true in Greek, but it's a word that, that is inclusive of, not exclusive of, women as well, but he's simply saying that we have the right to become children of God. Well, if we have the right to become children of God, that God is giving the right to become children of God, then they're not children of God yet. The ones that are in that state are not yet the children of God, but they have the right to become children of God. We'll come back and address that particular verse a little bit later in the lesson. But I want you to turn, if you would, to John the 8th chapter. John chapter 8 we're not going to read the whole chapter, but I just want to notice a number of things from John chapter 8 that Jesus emphasizes the use of the word son or child of God that has to do with the ones that they're following. And, and you might remember that there was a confrontation that was existing in this chapter between Jesus and some of the religious leaders of the day who considered themselves to be the children of Abraham. <laughs> and he, he, he specifically rebukes them and lets them know that in fact, their, their conduct does not demonstrate that they're children of Abraham. Yes, they may be, in their case, they were biological descendants of Abraham. But he's saying, you're not acting like it. You're not being his children in the way that you're acting. And he, he goes on and he says this, beginning in verse 38 of John chapter 8 and verse 38. If you use in a pew Bible, that's on page 750. He says, I know you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. And they answered to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if, Abraham's if you were Abraham's children, now pay close attention to this use of the word children in relation to our topic this morning. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. They said to him, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself. But he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. Ye are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Excuse me. And does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. 
But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? So you see, he uses this on several occasions. He says, you're not children of Abraham because you're not doing like Abraham. You're not following his example. You're not, a, you're not children of God because you're not listening to God. I'm the one that came from God. He says, you're children of the devil. Now sometimes people, people expect that Jesus is always this person who's always making everybody feel good and always patting people on the back, whatever they're doing. But it's pretty obvious. He came straight out and let them know where they were at. Now that wasn't going to change the truth of anything. That was the truth. Hopefully from their, from their standpoint, it's something that helped them to realize where they were in relation to God. And for some of them, maybe it did. We're not given specific examples of the ones that he was talking to on this occasion. But we know there were many among the religious leaders of that day that were persuaded and became faithful disciples of Christ. But when we think about being children of God, we become children of God when we follow Christ. That's, that's one of the things that Jesus is emphasizing in these verses is that we follow Christ, we become children of God. Look at, look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 also emphasizes this matter of being, that being in Christ is what enables us to be children of God. Galatians chapter 3 beginning there in verse 26. I'll get you a page number here if I can get these pages to separate. It's number 812. He says, for you are all sons of God. I want you to again think in terms of you're all children of God in Christ, by, through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Now I say that an heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he's a master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of time came, when, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption of, as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So we see this emphasis on this privilege, this blessing of being a child of God in Christ. He's the only begotten Son. We might say he's the, one that, he's the one that was born into this world. When He came into this world, He's the Son of God. He, he is deity in the flesh. He's the one who had the rightful claim to this position. But He, share, he shares His Sonship with us that we receive this adoption we, we've, we're adopted by God as children of God. And, we, and it, this phrase when he says, he, he says, he uses this phrase, Abba, Father. That, that he sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. That is, the same spirit of being the son of God. As, as being a son of God. Not just, not just in a, some kind of a metaphorical sense. But in a real sense, we're children of God. And we can say to God, Abba, Father. That, that word Abba was a, was a phrase that I think is still used in some places in the world today, some languages. It was the terminology that was used for your own father. You know, probably you have a name you used for your father. You did, maybe some of you always, when you regressed, addressed your father, you called him father. More often than not, it's dad or daddy or Papa, or something like that. But, you know, for us, it was Daddy when, they, when we were real young. We got a little older, we kind of shortened it to Dad, you know. But that was, that, that, that's a name I wouldn't just refer to anybody as, right? <laughs> I wouldn't just go up and call anybody 
dad. I'm going to call my own dad, dad. So what he's really doing is personalizing this. He's saying, this is the word, and this word Abba was the word that was used by babies for their own dad. It was maybe even much like the word dad, dad. (laughs) The first sound often that a baby makes when he's referring to his dad, and maybe if you're if you're a father and you heard your child say dad da <laughs> the first time, it was a special moment when you realize that he's that this child, boy or girl, is recognizing you as their father and that and that intimacy that's there as well. So so again, this is predicated upon us being in Christ. And that, that has to do with us having a different identity. And, and that's something that's emphasized all through the New Testament. Is that there's a new identity that we have in Christ. In fact, we don't have to leave this passage. We notice what is the, at the end of chapter 3. When he says, there's no Jew or Greek. There's no male or female. There's no bond or free. You're all one in Christ. The things that, identif- that we use for our identity in much of the world and much of our interactions. He's not saying that they, people, they didn't still have other interactions here. But he's saying in relationship to God, we're the same. We have the same relationship. Male, female, Jew, Greek, American, non-American. <laughs> All of us have this same relationship in Christ. When we're in Christ, we have this and we have this new identity, but this new identity comes as a matter of a new birth. And that's one of the things that is mentioned also throughout the Bible is that there's a new birth that takes place. You might remember Nicodemus comes to Jesus by by night and is asking him about entering the kingdom of heaven. And he says in verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? We've gotten kind of accustomed to that phrase, right? Born again. Maybe we, we also recognize there's a lot of different ideas that people have about it. But we should recognize God is giving us a new beginning and a new identity. That we have a new connection with God. That is not just because we're part of his creation. Like sometimes people use that word of being we're children of God because we all came forth from his creation. No, we're looking at something that is more about being connected with God as his child. And he says, but, but it's, it's natural, the question Nicodemus says. Well, how can he be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say unto you, you must be born again. Now, I want you to think about that on the one hand from the standpoint of the man that's asking it in his society. So for, 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 many, in many, for many years, for millennia, the Israelites had been the people of God. The children of Israel was almost synonymous with saying the children of God. They would refer to God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now that was, doesn't mean they didn't understand that God was the God of all man. But it's a recognition that their ancestors had seen God for who He is. And they did have a relationship, a covenant relationship with him. But there, these, these statements that are being made are emphasizing that when we're talking about the new covenant, when we're talking about the new kingdom, we're describing those that are in Christ and have a new life and a new identity as they've been reborn. The word that, that's, translated born, that's translated again Did you know what it literally means? Above. Born from above is literally what it means. That we have now our our birth is from above. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22 says, You have purified your souls in obeying the truth through uh, through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, 
love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the Word of God which lives and abides forever. That, that description here, when he's saying that you're born again, not of corruptible seed, he says this is coming simultaneously and as a result of us having our souls purified in our obedience to the truth. And he says now we're being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. We use the word corrupt to mean evil, right? Am I wrong about that? Most people think, oh, there's some corruption. The word, the meaning of the word corrupt, it includes things that are evil, but it really is a broader term than that. It means things that are decaying. It's describing things that wear out. It's describing things that are temporal, that are temporary, that don't continue to exist. And you'll see that in a number of places in regard to our spiritual body in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in regard to speech that corrupts, that tears down in Ephesians chapter 4. But in this verse, he's saying there's the corruptible seed and the incorruptible. He's not talking about evil versus good. He's talking about something that's temporary, corruptible seed, and something that's incorruptible that is eternal. He's saying you're already born of corruptible seed. You're already born of the flesh that will die. You've already got this, and your identity, and so many times as we think about who we are and we describe ourselves, we might identify ourselves with our parents, with our ancestry, with, with our, our various legacies that we may have and occupations that we have, things that aren't going to last. Our visitors that are here today, Ruby and Lupe, Lu, Ruben and Lupe, <laughs> I ask them where they're from. Well, it was a little bit complicated because he was born in Lubbock, moved to Michigan, recently returned to San Antonio, my hometown. So we automatically had this, oh, San Antonio, you know, grew up there. I know the guy that's preaching where he's attending there, Terry Starling. We have those connections there. Guess what? All those things, places, occupations, heritage. They're, they're going to be gone. They're corruptible. They're going to die out. But now we have an incorruptible seed. I like, to, I like to also connect this with what is said in James chapter 1 when he says in verse 21, Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. And he describes the word as, as in other places as this, as this seed that's inside of us through God's word that continues to grow. That now we're part of something eternal. So while on the one hand we might say, as we think about being a child of God, almost, almost, almost as if it's not real. What I, I mean, think about this. We even use terminologies like this in regard to our brethren that we have. And, and by the way, Peter ties that to that as well that we just read a moment ago. Notice the last part of that verse, in sincere love of the brethren, the brothers. See, he doesn't just leave out the, he doesn't just talk about our relationship with God. He talks about our relationship with one another. But sometimes do we do this? Do we say, okay, so this is my, you know, this is my brother Ron. This is my brother Dean. And then my physical brothers come to visit. My fleshly brothers come to visit. And I say, this is my real brother, Scott. This is my real brother, Daniel. Well, why do we do that? Which is more real? Which is more real? Something that lasts temporarily or something that lasts eternally? Now, what's more real? I'm not saying that we don't understand when we say things like that. We're just talking about biologically, this is my brother. But you're my brethren for real. And forever. We're children of God forever. He emphasizes this, this connection we have in the next chapter of First Peter. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. And these, each one of these phrases are, are really 
significant phrases about who we are in Christ. You are a chosen generation. And I want you to remember, this is a Jew writing this, right? He's a Jew. He grew up under the law of Moses. He grew up knowing he was one of the chosen nation. But he's not writing this to Jews. He's writing this to Christians that included both Jews and Gentiles. He's saying, you're a, cho you're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people. I want to elaborate on that phrase for a minute. This is New King James Version. King James said, a peculiar people. And I've heard people say, yeah, brethren are sure peculiar, all right. <laughs> the idea of peculiar people, the real meaning of the word is even beyond the word special. It has to do with possession. It's God's own people. His own, his own people. So back to where we started. The children of God. These are God's own people. They're the chosen generation, royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous night light, who once were not a people, get that, get that, <laughs> who once were not a people, there was no people like this, now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. God doesn't do this, describe these things to us for us to become arrogant or, or in one way or another become disparaging to other people, but to recognize what a privilege and a blessing it is to be the people of God, to be His children. He doesn't want us to think this, this is just some kind of a wishful thinking. No, this is reality. He has... He has adopted us through Christ. He has, he has redeemed us. He's brought us back to Himself and reconciled us to Himself. He, he, he provides this. And here's, here's the wonderful news. It's for whosoever will. It's for whosoever will. Anybody can choose to be the people of God. You, know, you think about living back during the time of the Israelites... You're thinking, oh, there's the people of God. You know, there's His chosen nation. Look, look what God's doing. And you see references to some of these Gentile people. They recognize, oh, you're, you're, you're the people. I know about you, uh, Rahab the harlot. I know what happened to the Egyptians because of your God. Or some of the others that come along where, where they're recognizing in various quotes. of their, They see what, what a privilege it is, but what are, where are they at? They're kind, of, they're kind of on the outside looking in, right? There's the chosen nation. In the gospel, God says, you can all be my chosen nation. But it is going to be determined by whether or not you're going to listen to him. The description here, just, just to back up just a little bit, he says, these are the ones <clears throat> that proclaim the praises of him. Not the ones that are speaking against Him. Not the ones who are denying His existence. Not the ones who are disregarding His instruction. And as such then, you're the ones who He called out of darkness into His marvelous light. He's, as Colossians 1.13, He's translated you out of the par power of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And He's the King. So we think about that also as it looks at what happens, we might say, previously to us being born again. And that is our death to our old ways. Romans, 5, Romans chapter 6 emphasizes this in verse 3. He says, Or do you not know as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, he's not writing this to non-Christians. He's, he's writing this to Christians. It's already, the assumption is you've been baptized, but he's emphasizing, do you understand what happened when you were baptized? 
There was a change that took place. There was a death that preceded that burial. <laughs> Dead to ways that are in opposition to God and His will. Dead to denial of who He is. Dead to a failure of recognizing His Lordship over us. And, and you're buried and you're raised out of that water to walk a new life. New life, new birth, new identity, new existence in Him. Now, I want to talk just a little bit about what are the blessings of being a child of God. I mean, we could start with some very basic things. Calling God Father. Maybe we take that for granted. You know, we just... We're, we're accustomed to it. We, say, we begin our prayers often. Heavenly Father, Father in Heaven, Father God. We, we recognize that we're calling Him Father, but have we ever stopped to really think about what a blessing that is to really call God our Father? And again, that verse in chapter 4 and verse 6, that we say, Abba, Father. Do we walk through life knowing who our Father is? There was a fellow going down the street. He's whistling a tune. He just looks happy. He said, man, you look like you're on the world. He said, well, I don't, but my Father does. <laughs> you know, how many blessings do we disregard because we just don't always stop to think about what it is to have God as our Father? And maybe to recognize that in comparison to what it is to have our own fathers or to be a father. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8 reminds us that he knows what we need. This is where Jesus, and, and I know that's not the primary purpose that he's bringing out here, but he does emphasize it in regard to prayer. He's, he's given instruction about praying and he says, Therefore do not be like them, for your father, he uses the word father in this verse, your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. What a, what a blessing that is to know that God, God knows not only does He know what I need, He knows more what I need than I know what I need. Right? There's also a matter of us being an heir. Being a fellow heir with Christ. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 7. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, they're an heir of God through Christ. What it means to be an heir of God. You know, there have been some people who have died and had lots of money. There are <clears throat> challenges to who the heirs are. Sometimes people will <laughs> crop up. So I'm actually one of his sons that he abandoned years ago, or I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm related to him. So they want to be an heir. They want to have, they want to inherit some of that. You know, we don't, we don't have to battle others. We just need to be in Christ, and we become an heir of things that are worth more than any of those huge fortunes that people have left behind. There's nothing in comparison to the blessings that God offers us. And being his children. To know that, that not only is he our father, but he really does care for us. A phrase in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6. Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him. For he cares for you. And again, that's one of those things that we kind of take for granted. Not, not all religions believe that about the God they believe in, by the way. There's a lot of religions that don't believe that God is really a caring God, that He cares anything about you. He's, he's one that we need to submit to. He's one that we need to fear. We need to be concerned about His judgment. But there's not really any care that He has for you. And the demonstration of the care that He has for you, that He gave His Son to die on the cross. And mention in Hebrews chapter 12, if you'll turn over there, there's a number of places here, a number of uh, uh, <clears throat> points that are made here in Hebrews chapter 12 about him being a father in the comparison to our own fathers. And I know when I say this, that for the most part, for the most part, we had good fathers. 
We didn't have perfect fathers. They, all, they were all those who had sin as well. <laughs> but for the most part, we had good fathers. But I also recognize that there may be in, the, in our group today, in our audience today, people who did not have good fathers. And I'm, I, I, I'm sorry that you didn't. I wish you had. I had a very good father. I'm very thankful for the father that I had. But maybe even if when we think about this, at least to understand that for the most part, this is, this is how this goes, is that people have fathers that, that demonstrate their care for their... That's the natural thing. There are those without natural affection, but for the most part, it's a natural thing for fathers to care for their children and to want what's best for them. And so we're given that comparison, even in regard to discipline. He says in verse 5, You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as with sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord or discipline of the Lord, no, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by Him. For the, whom the Lord loves, He chastens and scourges every son whom He receives. That's a quotation from the Old Testament, particularly book of Proverbs. He says, If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but He for our profit, that we may be partakers of His holiness. I want you to just think about that phrase for a moment. When he says, our fathers chastened us, disciplined us. And the discipline, he's not just talking about punishment. He's talking about rules. He's talking about correction. He's talking about instruction. He's talking about the things that have to do with not just letting you go and wander your own way, but do things, get you to do what's right. And what did they do? Our fathers did that in what seemed best to them. What they had the ability, the way they, they could perceive was the best way to do that. But do you see the contrast when he says, but he, God, for our profit, it's always the best. Isn't it wonderful to know that it's always the best thing when God is telling us what to do? It may not fit what we want to do. Just like it does. It often doesn't fit what the child wants <laughs> when the father's telling him what to do or what not to do. And when we think about what God is telling us what to do, what not to do, it may not be what we want, but we can be certain it is always what's best for us because He's God and because He loves us. He cares for us. So he says, goes on, he says, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. But painful, nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. How many times you go back to your dad and say, I didn't know why you were telling me to do that. I didn't think it was what I needed to do, but now I realize you were telling me what I needed to hear. You were instructing me. You were, you were disciplining me. You were punishing me for something because you knew that that was a bad course or you were, you were making me do things because you knew it's the way I needed to do. And how much more would that be true of God? Even things that we say, I don't see why this is the right thing, or why this matters, or why, why, why do I need to do that? But do we believe who God is? And to know that doing what He wants us to do is always the right thing, and the best thing. It's also a blessing to know that He'll welcome you home. Well, just a reference. We're not going to read the whole parable of the prodigal son. But you might just remember when the prodigal son is returning home, he has repented, he's, he's coming back to God, or I mean, excuse me, to his father. And we, we understand that God is represented there by the father, but, but he's coming back to his father. He's expecting he's going to go back. He just knows he's going to be better off as a servant in his father's house than he is where he's living out there in the pigsty. <laughs> And so as he's coming back, in verse 20, he arose and came to his father. This is Luke chapter 15 and verse 20. He arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, 
I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe, put it on him, put ring in his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here, kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to make merry. Sometimes people need to come home. And I'm not talking about your physical home. I'm saying come back to God. We're going to have an invitation in just a minute. There might be somebody who needs to come home. And I hope you realize this is, this is God wanting you to come home. There's also, of course, the eternal home. In John chapter 14, where he said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you, so that where I am there you may be also. God wants us to be with him through eternity. And you can be. You just make the choice to follow him. I'm going to ask you, are you a child of God? John chapter 1 and verse 12 says, As many as received him to them... He gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in His name. So He describes those who believe in His name as those who receive Him. That is, this acceptance of Him. This acceptance of who He is. And, and believing who He is is essential to our relationship with Him. But I want you to notice one other thing. It's describing those who received Him, those who believe in Him, as having the right to become children of God. That still takes place at a time when somebody's willing to commit to him. And we find that that right to become is fulfilled in the verse that we began with. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 when he says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. He says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For, he says, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's your beginning point. You had a new birth when you're baptized. If you did, maybe you're here and you haven't done that. We hope you'll make use of this opportunity to come believing in Him, repenting of those things against His will, confessing your faith in Him, be baptized for the remission of your sins, and raised to walk that new life, that new birth, that new beginning in Christ, born of water and spirit. If we can help you in any way, we invite you to come forward as we stand.